It is uh, with great pleasure that I, Yehuya Dambangutia, stand before you, and I'm here, and uh, with many guests who have joined us today. We are fortunate to have distinguished panelists today that will help us understand the times we live in and the relevance of today. The theme that we have uh, put together for this occasion is fighting against denial. And the scholars that we'll hear from have uh, compiled their knowledge, writings, and they will share with us what it is about fighting denial. Since the end of 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, deniers have never ceased to spread theories which vary from the direct negation of the genocide to the theory of the double genocide. The main aim of this panel is to inform and shed light on our audience and those they will talk to about the key messages. And I want to introduce the panel to you today. We have Dr. Margie Ensign, uh, is the president of Dickinson College and the former president of the American University of Nigeria. Among her distinguished publications, she authored Rwanda, History and Hope. We have Dr. Gatsinzi, who is an associate professor of English at Alabama A&M University in Huntsville, Alabama, where he teaches post-colonial theory and literature. In 2006 and 2007, he was a visiting professor at the University of Rwanda. Dr. Gatsinzi studied and published genocide scholarship, and among other things, the colonial roots of the genocide against the Tutsi. And we have Dr. Linda, uh, who is an investigative journalist and author, who worked at the London Evening Standard and the Sunday Times. She is an honorary professor at the Department of International Politics, University of Wales, Arbor with an expert on the Rwandan genocide of 1994. And she is author of People Betrayed, the role of the West in Rwanda's genocide in 2000 and Conspiracy to Murder, the Rwanda genocide that was published in 2004. And with us as well, we have um, Q Sanhuari. He's one of the prominent Rwandan youth leaders and part of the executive team of the Rwandan community in here in the United States. He received his bachelor's in communication and Spanish from Concordia College and master's from North Dakota State University. He is currently an international business development officer at Weather Modification International in Fargo, North Dakota, and that is where he resides. So with that, the panelists, Linda, Dr. Gatsinzi, President Ensign, and Mr. Chusa, I'll round robin you and uh, see if you can share what you have prepared for us today. And uh, with no particular order, I am going to take the moment now to start with Dr. Uh, Linda. And uh, if you can hear me, I want to hear a hello from you, Linda. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. And you uh, picked the first number for the question. And uh, my question to you this afternoon, this evening, what have you uncovered to be the role of international community in exposing the truth of the conspiracy of genocide denial? What have you uncovered in your research to be the role of the international community in exposing the truth of the conspiracy of genocide denial? Well, I think, first of all, um, one has to look uh, in 1994 to the Commission of Experts that was created by the United Nations Security Council and found incontrovertible evidence that the genocide of the Tutsi had been planned uh, for a long time that it fulfilled the legal criteria of genocide, that is the intent, the planning, the intent to destroy a human group. The international community, I call it the Security Council of the UN, which is responsible for 
the application of the 1948 uh, uh, Genocide Convention, then went on to create an international tribunal and the facts of the genocide emerged there. But I think the role of the international community, the Security Council in uncovering this uh, has perhaps been, been patchy. Um, I think uh, it is uh, to the individual governments to track fugitives and arrest them. These governments have failed. France remains a safe haven. There are apparently in the UK several hundred genocidaires. So I think it's now up to individual states to ensure mm. that abiding still by the convention to prevent genocide and in the worst possible case to punish it. So it falls to the Security Council of the UN to ensure that the perpetrators are punished. Um, that was a rather long-winded answer to your question. I hope I have answered it. You, you have, and thank mm -hmm. you. And so with that, uh, from what mm -hmm. you just stated, uh, Linda, mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like international systems have not fared well, but so mm -hmm. to what you know, have any international justice systems and what measures have they taken, even before we go to individual states, in mm -hmm. dealing with these genocide perpetrators? What, has, ha, what have they done so far? Well, I think very little. And I think, as I've just said, I think it is down to individual states to put these. You know, in the UK, there are five suspected genocide who have seen their day in court, and there is mm -hmm. sufficient evidence to put them on trial, and yet my own government fails one to extradite them and fails to to um, put them on trial if you're not going to extradite these people then put them on trial uh, in each individual capital so I think that that's mm. very important but could I just say one thing I think I've answered your question I have a third book that was published last year <laughs> called Intent to Deceive which is about how um, a program of denial uh, tries to obscure and diminish uh, the fact of the 1994 genocide, but perhaps you will come to that later. I don't know. But I, I thank you. Yes, indeed, uh, you have written quite a bit, and oh. that is much appreciated. And uh, hopefully, the audience will appreciate that and look up some of your books. So uh, next, uh, let me go to Dr. Gatinzi and. Uh, uh, as, as we have noticed, uh, concerns about genocide ideology, genocide denial persists. As stated by Gregory Stanton's work, denial is the final stage of genocide and can predict further genocidal violence. So to you, uh, Dr. Gatinzi, could you please help us understand the historical accuracy of, and its importance today? And then, um, and adding to that, what is combating genocide denial? Why is it so essential? And what strategies can you share that need to be employed or have been employed uh, to fight that denial? Uh, first, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Gregory Stanton in your question. Not only does he say that genocide denial follows a genocide, but he also says that uh, there is a process with stages leading to genocide and at any one point, at any one of the stages, the process can be halted, can be stopped. Um, in our United States, we not too long ago in the 50s, we had Jim Crow laws, but we mm -hmm. no longer have them. In South Africa, we had apartheid laws, but we no longer have them. So it's, it's, it's important that at any one stage, uh, that, that can be, uh, genocide can be prevented. Uh, in Rwanda, in, contra in contrast, no single stage was ever halted. Uh, discrimination went on unabated. Persecution of the Tutsi went on unabated. Uh, so 
So there are always signposts to the genocide. Now, to your question of historical accuracy, in addition to having research skills for the researchers, be they historians, be they um, investigative journalists like uh, uh, Linda Mervyn here and, and so on, you also need to have moral and intellectual integrity. And I want to emphasize that aspect, uh, integrity. Take uh, somebody like Ferdinand Nahimana. Uh, he had a PhD in history from the University of Paris. Now, mm -hmm. ask him to write a book on the history of genocide and imagine what kind of inaccuracies will be in that book. So uh, moral integrity is very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, now, the second question uh, that relates to denial, it also relates to historical accuracy. If you are inaccurate, inaccuracy amounts to denial. Take mm -hmm. somebody who says that the genocide against the Tutsi was caused by the downing of President Habyarimana's plan. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what uh, Peter Erlinda has written. Uh, that's what other genocide deniers have written. What they're ignoring is the history of a genocide, that there were, there were all those stages, classification, symbolization, uh, persecution, dehumanization, they don't take account that history, so they are deliberately deceiving. And uh, to use a phrase from the title of Linda Mervyn's book, they, their intent is to deceive. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are strategies that have to be used and that have been used. One is, first of all, expose the genocide deniers name them by names, but also expose their methodologies, the contradictions inherent in their methodologies, their, uh, their omissions in their research and so on. Let me just give two, two quick examples. One quick, uh, one quick example. Um, Alan Stamm and Christian Davenport wrote a an article entitled What Really Happened in Rwanda. One of the things they wrote was that the killings were spontaneous. Nothing is spontaneous about a genocide. But something I want to emphasize, they said that Tutsis and Hutus are indistinguishable by virtue of the intermarriage that went on among mm. them, uh, between them for centuries. Well, what they deliberately don't write about in the article is that there were identification cards, identity cards, which labeled every individual as Tutsi and Hutu, and those with Tutsi identity cards had to be to be um, eliminated. There was intent to eliminate them. Mm -hmm. Another strategy uh, that uh, has been used, and I will use um, the example of Professor Josia Semujanga recently, just in January this year, Radio Canada gave an interview to Judy River. Uh, Professor Semujanga wrote a letter complaining and to the management, and the management defended the journalists because what Semujanga was saying is that the journalists had violated the ethics of journalism. Uh, mm -hmm. The management defended him, and then he wrote another letter to the ombudsman uh, which had, he had uh, academics uh, and other researchers signed the letter. I'm uh, Linda Mervyn here and myself signed the letter. And the ombudsman after the research uh, investigation found that the Radio Canada and uh, the journalists were at fault to give a platform to somebody, Judy Rever, the author of uh, Le Loge du Saint or In Praise of Blood, uh, who wrote that uh, there were two genocides. So 
they apologized and they, opposed, they posted the apology on their website. In short, exactly. there are strategies that are activism is very important. Thank you, and uh, thank you for that. And obviously in the audience, uh, I'm sure they will appreciate the fact that the battle continues and uh, even the, the so benign or uh, de deceptive ways that may not be as obvious, but nonetheless, there are ways that they, they're getting their message across. So we need to expose them and find a best way to counter these kinds of lies. I'll move over to Dr. Uh, Ensign, if you hear me. And uh, I just want to preface my question to you, Dr. Ensign. Uh, it's undeniable that in Rwanda, post-genocide society, politically, economically, legal, health, and other areas, technology, gender equality, there's been remarkable progress. For those who have gone to Rwanda have seen that, and we have had the opportunity to read about it. Now, in your experience, uh, as you have uh, looked into this uh, situation with Rwanda and their development, can you share some of your findings in what have you found, how this development post-genocide has impacted society there in these areas, especially, uh, be it uh, economic, legal, healthcare, technology, gender equality, what have your findings uh, been and what can you share with us today? First, thank you for the invitation to be with you and all of my distinguished panelists who are doing so much to tell the true story of the genocide against the Tutsi. So it's an honor to be with you. Um, thank you. There's, there's so much to talk about when we look at the progress in Rwanda and um, there's much to learn about reconciliation and hope and progress by looking at where Rwanda has come in 27 years. 27 years ago, we know the country was devastated. There was no Rwanda. And when you, when you take that context and realized that life expectancy has more than doubled, for life expectancy to double, health and education and infrastructure, access to healthcare, all of those things must be in place. So that's implied by that. A million people have been pulled out of poverty the majority of parliamentarians are women. Most young people have access now to education. 95% um, have access to health insurance. So against all odds, Rwanda has emerged from those ashes to be a leader in human progress. And um, I, I will say though, thinking of the discussion that we just heard about denial when these data are presented, there is always a yes, but. Mm -hmm. Yes, but the leadership is too strong. Yes, but the poor really aren't involved in those decisions that affect their life. So I, I wish that researchers looking at Rwanda dug deeper to see that this progress has resulted, I believe, from four elements, a national vision that emerged right after the genocide, a strong national vision that was focused on improving people's lives, particularly improving women's lives. There are a few countries that can attest to that. Um, a vision that said, we're going to be pro-poor in our government policies. Widespread communi community participation will lead the way with accountability. That's Imahigo, which I believe is a global model. Um, Development partners need to look at our plans and not just come in and say what they're going to do, but to fill, fit in to our national plans. And finally, Rwanda is one of those countries that's constantly evaluating, constantly saying, are we on the right path? Mm -hmm. um, so I think we all need to speak to the deniers, not only to make sure they are beginning to have some moral integrity um, and understand the genocide against the Tutsis, but also acknowledge the enormous and important human progress that's occurred in the last 27 years. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, the youth, uh, I come to Mr. Chusa. The statistics show that uh, Africa in general will have a rather large young population 
in not few years, if not already. And following 27 years of uh, the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, like many other countries in Africa, there is a youth bulge. There's uh, a lot of youth that are coming up. And uh, now you as a young man, uh, what do you see, if you can share, what do you see the role of those young people in the country as they develop and what have you seen and what do you think? Just you put yourself in the shoes of those young people. How do you participate in the future of Rwanda as it develops, as Dr. Ensign just shared of the many things that are going on? Mr. Chusa, it is your turn. Thank you very much. So it's always a, a, a privilege to, to be speaking on behalf of the youth, but I always want to acknowledge that I am a single voice in the majority of the youth, but I'll try to do my best. One thing is to, to look at history. When you look at the past, the youth liberated Rwanda. The youth, a lot of them was, were uh, heading many households. They were orphans. They rebuilt Rwanda. When you look at the present, the youth are still, thanks to the leadership of His Excellency Paul Kagame and the government, are actually actively participating in the transformation of Rwanda. So it's helping the youth actually visualize, which is an essential step when you want to achieve greatness, is when you see people like, like you in those leadership positions. When you look at Rwanda, not only women are in many uh, decisional and very um, essential uh, leadership roles, but as well, very young people. The other thing I'll say is, it is so inspiring, because when you see what's happening in Rwanda, it, it's, I think, inspiring as well for not only uh, the Rwandan youth, but as well the Rwandan youth in the diaspora. I always invite them to just look what Rwanda is doing. You have associations like IORG, uh, uh, the survivors, uh, students uh, of, of the genocide of the Tutsi. You have Never Again, but you have as well institutions that are dedicated in making research, like the CNLG. But when you're in a, in a foreign country, I'll invite as well the youth to look at um, what are other uh, communities doing in the country where they reside. But when it comes to Rwanda, honestly, the youth are so inspiring and, and the youth I think are valued by its government. And many times I even have uh, other African youth uh, or other youth in general, envying a little bit how much in Rwanda, when you come back, you know that you're gonna be an active agent of the transformation of, uh, of your country. And like you said, demographics speaks for itself. So when you see the new vision we have for 2035 and also 2050, I'm very confident in saying that the youth has an active role in it and the youth should really uh, pick, up, pick, pick up the challenge and be proud of itself because past, present, future, the youth has always have an active role in the transformation of this beautiful Rwanda that is inspiring so many countries out there. So it's in a nutshell, that's what I could say. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I'm gonna give uh, a follow-up question to that. One of the things that we're seeing that right now, Mr. Chusa, is the social media being a platform or a weapon of choice. How do you see the young people that are involved in revisionism and denial? How can we use that same tool to combat that, what, what would be something that uh, the young, if there are any young people listening today that we will share this with, what do you think they can do to change that course? So as we're talking about denialism, what can the youth do? Thank you very much. So many things where we've been blessed is uh, Rwandan proverbs. And there's one that says, So always remembering that no matter what, people are saying out there, the truth shall always prevail. Second, another uh, proverb we have is So one of the things that saddens me, obviously, is there's uh, a segment, like you said, of youth that sadly either were too young when the genocide against the Tutsi took place or were not even born. Yet, they're, as you're saying, spreading uh, a, a very distorted uh, reality of what's happening in Rwanda and what happened in 1994 couple of things I'll say, uh, some, I think, strategies and pillars are important, is know that history. First of all, I really am inviting my peers to document yourself and really know your history, because you're the only one who's supposed, I hope, by now, to say it. Don't let other people say on your behalf, you should be saying it. Know thy audience. 
Know the people you're engaging and know where they're coming from. Know your sources as well. Like I said, there's CNLG, there's so many now researchers, documentaries, accurate, that are uh, really showing what really happened in Rwanda. Also know yourself. Sometimes I'm always inviting people to know your limitations. Maybe you're not the person who's gonna go a debate in public with people. Maybe you're better on social media, or maybe you're better at writing something and letting others say on your behalf, but you're really knowing yourself. But as well, foremost, heightened awareness. It's interesting when many times when you're in the USRCA, the, the US diaspora of Rwandans, when we've had times where you hear of a denier coming to a university, maybe in your vicinity, and now you rally up people around you and you say, let's go to this university and engage and make sure the university knows that they're about to host someone who doesn't have the actual reality of what happened in Rwanda. But last but not least is do not reinvent the wheel. As we know, the first uh, genocide in the 20th uh, century was a, a, of the Armenians. Then in the Second World War, there was the Jewish uh, genocide. Learn, learn from people that have been doing before us. They have had systems, they have methods. So really trying to learn from, from other people that are already doing it. So approaching the Jewish youth, the Armenian youth, and knowing how are you doing it? Because they've been doing it for many years. So with that is resilience, always knowing uh, the truth, and as well, always, always uh, keeping hope. I say hope because I've seen how Rwanda has been championing, reintegrating people that used to be uh, uh, heavy deniers, reintegrating people that were also taking arms to fight Rwanda, and they reintegrate them, and they're back in society, and they're active members. So always encouraging my peers to say, hey, even if you see someone saying something that is obviously not the truth, engage them, invite them. But you know that you're equipped to uh, uh, let them know that what they're saying is not the truth, and here's why. But an invitation is always better than just dismissing them or even worse, ignoring them. The, the last thing I think I'll let, let you with is always remembering that our elders took weapons and, and paid the ultimate sacrifice of some, a lot of them actually died. So we ought, it's our duty to take those digital, those social platforms, uh, weapons, and to really fight back. Because if we don't speak, who's going to speak on our behalf? Rakuzik Chan. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm going to go back to Dr. Linda as a follow up. Uh, in the interest of time, we are kind of pushing it. Uh, it's a multi pronged question I'm asking you, Linda. What lessons have we learned from Rwanda and other contemporary cases that can be used to prevent future genocides and other atrocity, atrocious crimes like that? And also, you've published extensively and reported on Rwanda. What was so uniquely different in how the atrocities were covered and portrayed, and what was the difference in your opinion? So it's kind of uh, what can be prevented and how does the image of Rwanda, how did they portray the atrocities in Rwanda and what can be prevented uh, in the future? Uh, I'm unmuted, yes, am I? Yes, um, thank you for that. Um, complicated, difficult question too. <laughs> two minutes. Um, uh, yes, I know, in only two minutes too. Well, I think, uh, I don't think any lessons have been learned uh, at all, actually. I, mm -hmm. I hate to say that, that sounds terribly pessimistic. But having looked closely at what happened in 1994, um, no, I don't think it's the lack of awareness, it's a lack of accountability, the press and the public not involved. I think there's an added problem when um, with uh, Rwanda uh, and Africa in general is that Western journalists seem to apply different rules when reporting Africa to the rules they apply when mm -hmm. reporting the West. I think that the accusations, misdemeanors, murders, goodness knows what else, that have been thrown at President Paul Kagame and his government in Kigali would never have been thrown at any European president or government at all with such scant uh, uh, evidence. It, it's with lack of evidence, lack of any evidence mm. whatsoever. So I think one, the lesson perhaps of Rwanda is that denial will always follow genocide. I think we knew that. And I think as, um, the user Natwalians just said it must always be challenged wherever it's 
it reared its head. And I just thank Dr. Getzinzi because yet again, I've listened to him and I've learned so much. So, um, and thank you very much for that question. I hope I've answered it. Have I answered those questions? <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, and I'll go back to Dr. Ensign. Um, we talked about the developments in Rwanda. We talked about what, how far we've come. In your opinion, what areas, if any, have been overlooked? What challenges have the communities faced after atrocities like in Rwanda, you, whether it's Rwanda in particular or other areas that you have looked into? What are some of the those challenges that have been overlooked that need to maybe be addressed? You know, thank you so much for the question. I don't think this issue is being overlooked, but it's a it's a looming challenge that has to be dealt with in Rwanda. Um, Rwanda has one of the fastest population growths on the continent, um, doubling uh, very quickly uh, by 20, I believe, 42. Uh, Rwanda will have doubled from where it is now. Um, so the issue is. The, one, of, one of the highest fertility rates also in the country. And I know the government is putting in place efforts to make sure that women have access to reproduc reproductive health and female education, the two most important things to control population growth. So uh, I think it's an issue that has to be confronted. It's a difficult one, mm -hmm. um, but uh, no one wants to make, no one wants to see this incredible progress threatened. The second piece is during COVID, every country has been affected. Rwanda was on track to have a 10% um, growth rate in its GDP this last year, but Rwanda's economy is still primarily based on exports and tourism and mining coffee and tea and so on. And the economy has taken a big hit this year. So I think as every country's economy, this is not unique to Rwanda, the population growth is fairly unique at this point. So I think those two issues are important. And I think all of us who, who can need to make sure that this progress continues because this is, Rwanda is the example for the world at this moment um, with gender equality, with poverty reduction. So it's in everyone's interest to make sure that this proceeds, but those two issues I think need to be tackled. Um, uh, and I know uh, the president and his leadership are, are working hard on both of them. Excellent, thank you very much. It, uh, we are running out of time for this segment and I'm going to pose one last question to Dr. Gatsinzi. You recently published an article on the ambiguity or the words uh, that were used to uh, talk about the events in Rwanda in 1994. How do you see, uh, how can we help combat the misnomer? You know, this, the, this double meaning that could lead us to, to hear people do the denials as you have come to find. First of all, I am, let, me, let me begin by saying how, as somebody who grew up in exile, how, uh, impressed I am when I, I uh, go to Rwanda and go there very, very, very often. Uh, the, 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 what, the changes that have taken place, the identification that was there before because identification classification is really part of the, uh, it's one of the stages in genocide before the genocide, those were fixed identities. You are either Hutu, you were either Tutsi, or you are either Twa. Those were fixed identities that uh, lasted for since the 1930s when the Belgian, uh, the, the, when the Belgian um, administration uh, issued identity cards. The Hutu manifesto uh, said that, that those kind of identifications have to follow and there were um, policies of discrimination, uh, the student population not surpassing 10%, the, 10, the uh, Tutsi student population not, not surpassing 10%. So there is before and after. And so people who, so people who write about the genocide, when they don't take into account the question of 
the identities that were constructed, that were fixed, when they don't say they, uh, uh, and I'm talking about people who write about the genocide, the Rwandan genocide without putting that in context because there has to be a historical context. There has to be a reference. So when they talk about the Rwandan genocide, usually they are implying that there were two genocides that all Rwandans, regardless of the prior identities. Um, so that's, that's, that's uh, negationism, definitely. That's denial. So in, quickly, I'm very, very, very impressed by uh, the new national awareness. If you asked somebody like Chusa, young man here, uh, you know, you said, if you ask him, who are you, Tutsi or Twa? Those identities, of course, the American public got to know them through Hotel Rwanda. They know, that's all they know, they are either Hutu or Rwanda. Chusa will tell you, I'm Rwandan. That's the new, that's the generation I envy, a generation that is not like ours who grew up with these uh, stigmatized identities. Thank you very much. And uh, unfortunately, as much as uh, I've learned, time has come and gone. And uh, I thank you all for participating and the answers you have provided. And I hope that the audience has uh, been enlightened a little bit as we continue to learn the fight against nihilism. And with that, we are going to turn things over to uh, a song by uh, Mugwiza, and then thereafter, we'll hear from another guest, uh, Ms. Margaret Horan Bond, the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary, Bureau of African Affairs, Department of State. And so with that, uh, we will welcome the music portion of the service. Thank you again to the panelists. <laughs> Oh, God. 
Thank you for that rendition. As I mentioned, uh, Ms. Margaret Horan Bond, Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary, Bureau of African Affairs, Department of State, uh, is a career member of the Senior Foreign Services and has served as Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Central Africa since January 15, 2021, and before that, as Director of the Office of Central African Affairs since July 2020. Prior to joining the African Bureau, Margie served as Director of the Office of Economic and Development Assistance in the Bureau of International Organization Affairs. She speaks Spanish and French. Margie earned her Bachelor's of Arts in English and American Literature from Harvard College and her Master of Science of Foreign Service African Studies from Georgetown University. At this moment, Ms. Horan Bond, we want to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and that was a beautiful um, rendition of a uh, song. I, I enjoyed it very much and, and thank you very much for that. Um, I want to thank Ambassador Mukantavana and to our distinguished host and to the panelists for inviting me to join you today. Um, it is an honor to join you virtually on the solemn occasion of Quibuga 27. The United States joins you in commemorating the more than 800,000 men, women, and children who died in 1994. On this 27th anniversary, we grieve for those whose lives were lost, for the families who forever will miss their loved ones and for the survivors who suffer as both victims and witnesses to one of the darkest chapters in human history. I admire the strength and resilience of the people of Rwanda. They united in reconciliation to move the country forward to become a more peaceful and a more prosperous nation. I admire Rwanda's commitment and contributions to help ensure that such atrocities will never happen again anywhere, which it demonstrates every day as a major contribution contributor to international peacekeeping. The United States shares the same commitment to prevent the horror of mass atrocities and genocide from occurring again. Together with the international community and the people of Rwanda, we will not stop working for justice for all victims of these crimes. Through our War Crimes Rewards Program, we continue to offer up to $5 million for information that leads to the arrest of the remaining six individuals wanted by the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals. Let this be a message to all those responsible for these heinous acts that they will be held accountable. On this solemn occasion, we take this opportunity to remember our common humanity, recommit to protecting the vulnerable, and to uphold inherent human dignity. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, Ms. Bond. At this time, as uh, years have passed, we still have stories that we hear about the incidents and the atrocities in Rwanda. We are blessed today to have a young lady who will bring a testimony of her experience of 1994. And Aline Umutoni is a young lady born in Rwanda, and uh, she was raised in many countries. And we are grateful that Aline, you are here today. And I'll not take up any time to tell you what I have on paper about you because you are here in person. So I give you this time to please share your story and thank you for being here today. Um, good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be here to um, commemorate the 27th um, year of the genocide against Tutsis of 1994. My name is Ali Numotoni. I was born in Rwanda 
on October 20th, 1988. I was raised by two parents that had two different backgrounds. My, my father was Tutsi and my mother was Hutu, but her mother was Tutsi. I, uh, I believe that I was loved from a young age because the memories that I have from the time I learned to know my name and everything, they were very memorable. Although I lost my mother when I was 13 months and she was murdered um, in a car crash that was orchestrated to actually kill a priest who was a journalist in Butari and who was uh, known to be uh, part, of the, um, part of the political opposition uh, against the, the Hutu regime. So they, 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 they planned to terminate him and my mother was in the same car as that priest. So I lost my mother when I was 13 months and um, I was raised uh, by my father who was, uh, his name was Kurawiji Jean-Baptiste. He was the chairman of the Liberal Party in Butari. Uh, he was a doctor. The memory that I have of him was his smile and um, the way he used to sing to me. Um, I'm sorry, I'm full of emotions because I miss my dad. It's been 27 years, but I miss him. I still miss him. Um, I did not know that I was Tutsi. I did not know, I was not raised uh, uh, with a father who told me uh, that I was Tutsi or Hutu. I had never heard a word Hutu or Tutsi. So I was a five year old who was just innocent and had had no idea of what what to be called other than just that I was loved by a father that loved me and that protected me until the end. So one day changed the day that changed my life for the for the worst. Uh, I don't know the date because I was still five, so I did not know the date that 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 horrific moment happened. But I remember that day like it was yesterday. I was playing with my father, and uh, we were playing, and he was smiling. And uh, I I still remember his face. I still remember his smile. And there was a knock, and that knock changed his face, and he became extremely serious and. He took me into the bedroom and he put me under the bed and he told me very, very, very strongly not to not to leave the bed, not to leave the place he put me until he come and get me. But unfortunately, he did not close the door. I don't know if it was unfortunate or I don't know. To this day, I, I try to wonder if I had to see what I saw or if it was the worst thing for me to do. But as a little girl, I decided to look down and try to see what was happening on the other side. And all I could see were the feet of the people that were there. But during the Gachacha court, uh, two of the three men that came to kill us were arrested and they shared the story of how they came to, to kill my dad and I. And they mentioned that they knock at the door and my dad went to open and they told him that they came to kill him. And my dad asked them who sent them. And he mentioned, they mentioned the name of that person who happened to be his friend. And I went to see him in prison in 2012. And uh, when my dad heard his name, he was relieved and he said, oh, I know him. He's my friend. Uh, please give me a minute. I need to write him a letter and take it to take that letter to him. If he sends you back to come and kill me, then come back. Because my dad was convinced that if he knows that it's him, he's going to protect him. But unfortunately, a few minutes later, they came back and they told him, yes, he told us to come and kill you. So they describe how they did, how my dad took off his glasses and they started cutting him. I could hear my dad scream until I could, I could hear my hero 
scream until they pulled his body and pulled him until it was silent, completely silent. And as a child, my world was shattered. My world was broken. I did not know what to do. I was scared of breathing because I felt like if I breathe, they will hear me and they will come. But a part of me still believed my dad will come back because I was still a girl. Few minutes later, when they finished to terminate him and threw his body in a place that they refused to this day to tell us. It's been 27 years that I've been begging to know where my dad has been thrown and I don't know. I can't express how painful it is to not bury the person that gave life to you. I can't express how painful it is to still to this day have people deny that there was a genocide when I don't even know where my dad is. Of course, I stayed there waiting for my turn and they came back. So when they finished throwing him up, they went to report to the person that had sent them. And the person told them that, what about the little girl? And they say there was no little girl to say, oh no, go back and find that little girl. They came back to look for me. And when they entered in the house, they started looking around and there were two. And then one of them decided to come towards the room. And before they got into the room, there was one, one of the three was outside. And he said, leave this cockroach. If she's not dead, she would die. We have more cockroaches to kill. And that was the first time I was called a cockroach. And I didn't understand what it meant. So my identity went from being this innocent girl to being a cockroach. Because from that moment, I understood that I was just there to run for my life, just like a cockroach. I stayed under the bed and this lady who's actually related to the killers came to see if we survived and she said that something told her to come in the room and look under the bed and when she saw me she took me and she sent me to a, a, a Tutsi family that was hiding and she handed me to them and she said, they are now your parents and your mother and your siblings. The family had four children. And unfortunately, along the way, that family was killed in front of me. It's hard for me to describe the things that I've seen at the, at the age of five. It's hard for me to describe the level of trauma that I, I had gone through from the age of five, having to not being able to sleep at night, being afraid of knife, forks, fireworks, boots, because I saw those killers wearing boots and singing and chanting songs that to this day are, are roaming in my mind. If I have to reiterate everything that I've seen, I don't think I can do it. But the reason why I've been, I decided to no longer keep silence, because unfortunately my father was killed by my relatives on my mother's side. For 22 years, I've been silent. For 22 years, I've known the truth. And I kept silent because I was afraid of losing them.
But I decided, I realized that if we keep quiet, the deniers will win. I realized that in the 22 years of my life, I've lived with the deniers. I've lived with those who never mentioned the genocide, those who called it a war. I've watched war movies and what I've seen, I have never seen it in my entire life in any war movies, because that was not a war. My dad didn't have a, a, a knife to fight. He didn't have, he didn't have a gun. He had a pen and a paper. I was playing with him in a minute and I lost him the next. Nobody can tell me that there was a double genocide where so many people died and were burned. My father was engaged to his fiance and she was burnt alive along with her siblings and her parents. Nobody can tell me that there was no genocide when I lost 98% of my family on my father's side. How can somebody to this day on two, in 2021, we are still talking about whether or not there was a genocide? We don't even have to do any, any school. We can we just need to see to go to Rwanda and see the bones in the museum. See the clothes of children that were killed. That were not killed, shot. Because to, for you to be shot, you had to pay for it. Because you did not deserve to be shot. You had to be tortured until you die. So today my, 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 my goal and my, and my determination is to encourage every person, especially survivors. It's time for us to speak. We can no longer be silent. I've been silent for 22 years. I've lived with the deniers. I've lived with them. I've listened to them. I've heard them denying over and over and over and over again. And I am deciding if I have to die while fighting, so be it. I've lost so much that I have nothing else to lose. I miss my dad. I was raised in 22 countries because I didn't have a dad. I lived with the person who killed my dad for three years. You can't imagine what it does to you when the people you trusted the most are the one that killed your, the person you love the most on earth. So I want to encourage every single survivor, every single person who loves Rwanda, that this, the only weapon we have is our story. There's, there's a quote that... Uh, First Lady Michelle Obama said, when they go low, we go high. The only way we can go high is by talking. It's by writing. It's by leaving books for the next generation. So that the next generation can have the real narrative of what really happened. I was not, I was not a teenager. I was just a thought. I was a little girl. But I know without a doubt that what I've seen it's no way a double genocide. It is no way a massacre. And it is no way something that was not perpetrated. Because there's no way you can have a group of militia, well armed, well skilled, ready to cut people to pieces if they were not trained and, and built up that ideology. So I plead to you, let us rise all generations, young, old, any person, to fight this ideology and one and for all silence the deniers so that they can pay for what they've done. Thank you. I mean, thank you. Thank you. This is why we're here today. We're here 
to understand. We are here to comfort. We are here to take the mantle that you have and the challenge you have posed to us. To deny to deniers, we are present and must make sure that the denying ends. Thank you for your courage, uh, I mean, and uh, it's a blessing to have you, to see you, to hear you, and your pain is palpable, and we cannot, we dare not forget that this is real. Right now, let us hear a poem by a young student from, uh, a Rwandan student from the University of Arkansas, Iana Ruhetamachumu. If you can hear me, this is your moment. Letter to my fellow Rwandans. 27 years ago, our nation saw horrors that were unimaginable. Children were left orphans. Spouses were left widows and widowers. Parents were left childless. Our nation was divided and hurt. We cannot go back and change the past but we can work together to build a better tomorrow. Ijiuga wakura mbele batu uvate, nitukwe tuza kumeza kujiteze mbele. As we rest in the peace our parents fought hard for, let us remember to keep promoting forgiveness and brotherhood. Let us remember to keep dreaming and working hard to create a better tomorrow. Let us be brave in fighting to end the genocide ideologies. As time passes, let us educate ourselves about our history so that this will never happen again. Let us lead with excellence so that we can create a safe home, not only for our children, but also for our parents and the heroes who fought for us. Rwanda Rwiza, Rwanda Dukunda, Diyugu Chatu Bjaye, Chika Turera Neza, Ihorere Shenji, Thank you, thank you. Um, it gives me the pleasure at this time to call on the Honorable Ambassador to the United States from Rwanda, Madam Ambassador, we invite you now to address the audience and thank you again for making this possible for us to gather here, to hear, to learn, and from here on to tell the world that never again, Madam Ambassador, welcome. Thank you so much, Yero. Good afternoon, everyone. Deputy Assistant Secretary in the, the Bureau of African Affairs, Ms. Margaret Bond, Excellencies, Ambassadors, and members of the Diplomatic Corps, President of the USRCA, Yehoyada Mbangukira, eminent panelists, Dr. Margie Ensign, Dr. Linda Mervin, Dr. Vasani Nyenzigasinzi, and Mr. Chu Sanwari, Ms. Aline Mutoni, your students who perform for us this afternoon, distinguished guests, friends, and compatriots. It's very difficult for me to speak right after what Aline just said, but I just uh, want to give brief remarks. I want to express my gratitude to all of you who have come to show solidarity with us on this day remembrance. On behalf of the government of Rwanda and our embassy, I would like to thank the United States for the, the statement delivered to mark the commemoration of the genocide against the Tutsi. We deeply appreciate your support and the partnership in the reconstruction of our country. And I hope that our relationship will continue to deepen and expand over the years. And we look forward to continue our engagement to discuss on the value of using the proper terminology, genocide against the Tutsi. I also thank representatives of various countries who are here with us. 
to express their support, solidarity, and friendship for the people of Rwanda. The eminent panelists went into detail about various aspects of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. We also had the glimpse of what survivors endured during the moving testimony of Aline. I can't add anything. April 7 marks the day of remembrance of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi and the start of 100 days of mourning. On the, on the subject of historical memory, yet yeah, historian David Blight had this to say in his 2018 biography of Frederick Douglass. Memory, Blight writes, is both inspiration and burden, method and subject, the thing one cannot live with or without. And these words echo those of Holocaust survivor author Eddie Wiesel, who said in accepting the Nobel Peace Prize in 1986, because I remember, I despair. Because I remember, I have the duty to reject despair. In Rwanda, we have come to accept the burdens and obligations of memory. We are inextricably bound to our past, however painful, but we are not bound to repeat it. Indeed, it's by remembering that we honor the lives lost, express solidarity with those who survived, and find powerful inspiration to build a society too strong, too full of hope, to permit the emergence of the hatred and violence they tore but destroyed us 27 years ago. Our solemn task is to speak plainly about what happened in 1994 and to counter efforts to obscure or distort our history. We owe this to the victims and survivors, of course, but to knowledge and obligation to generations as yet unborn. If we fail to reckon with the truth of what happened, if we allow a false narrative to take hold in its place, to fatally undermine the mission encapsulated in just two words by Vizel and embraced wholeheartedly by the Rwandan people, and our many friends across the world, never again. So I ask you to join me today in committing not to just to say never again, but to never forget. May we never forget that between April 7th and July 4th, 1994, more than 1 million Rwandans, mostly Tutsi, exceeding just in 100 days the number of total battlefield death recorded over four years of the American Civil War. That fewer than 150,000 Tutsis living in Rwanda during the genocide escaped, escaped alive. That as many as 500,000 women were raped. Many left to bring the children of their tormentors into the world, many more infected with HIV. We never forget that the United Nations ignore repeatedly all the detailed warning about the coming genocide. That the Security Council kept their peacekeeping presence in Rwanda called the UNAMIR to a bare minimum. That when leaders of the depleted mission asked to be able to seize arms from militia groups, they were denied. When they sought permission to actively protect the population, Again, they were denied. May we never forget that as the genocide came to an end, the French military led a UN approved humanitarian campaign called Operation Turquoise, providing passage into the neighboring Zaire, now DRC, for up to 2 million people. That it enabled the government officials and army officers who had planned the genocide to escape, taking thousands of ex soldiers and militia with them. That hidden in the chaos of refugee camps, these groups came together again and again to attack Rwanda, setting that stage for the instability and violence that has afflicted the region ever since. Ladies and gentlemen, Rwanda is a small country, as one of one uh, that hidden in the chaos of refugee camps, and I, I, I apologize. Ladies and gentlemen, we will never forget the moral imperative expressed uh, by one of our countrymen, historian Tom Gahiro, 
what happened in Rwanda should not be treated by the world differently from the Holocaust. On the basis that Rwanda is a small, faraway country without resources, whose genocide, therefore, somehow becomes of secondary importance. To deny the true dimensions of the Rwandan tragedy of 1994, to label it as war, like what Aline was saying, to describe it, to describe it as an ethnic struggle, to bring up the double genocide thesis, to name it what it's not. It's not Rwandan genocide, it's genocide against the Tutsi. Is to take a stand against humanity and it's a determination to prevent a future genocide, genocide anywhere in the world. In a mere 27 years, the Rwandan people who have forged a path away from despair and hopelessness towards a future brimming with the possibility and promise. Allow me to reflect briefly on how we got there. As the post-genocide, the government tackled the daunting challenge of pulling Rwanda back from the brink of total state failure to imperative the Surab, establishing peace and security, and finding a path to justice and reconciliation. Without meeting these fundamental challenges, we could not begin to start building a viable political economy capable of helping citizens build healthier and more prosperous lives. The search for justice and reconciliation, dear ladies and gentlemen, immediately after the genocide, but the scale of the challenge was literally unprecedented in world history. What does justice mean? When a million of people took part in the crimes, what does reconciliation mean? When perpetrators and victims see each other in the market every day, we needed to find the right balance. Firstly, we opted for restorative justice over retribution. The injustice of mass slaughter could not be rectified by more killing. We drew on our rich cultural traditions and established gachacha courts across the country, a community-based system of conflict resolution that would deliver restorative justice as well as help bind together shadowed communities. Gachacha tried 2 million cases over 10 years, and the majority of perpetrators served modest sentences, sometimes involving little or no jail time at all. Mostly have reintegrated back into villages, where now they live side by side with the survivors and the families of victims. There's no point in pretending it's easy. The process of reconciliation is painful. It's painful. And it demands a sacrifice from anyone, everyone concerned. But it's vital to the country's progress, something that all Rwandans have come to understand for themselves. It's a long-term national process that requires continuous dialogue at all levels. We are working to inspire and entrench new thinking about Rwanda national identity and transcend, and transcend the ethnic ideology promoted by previous governments. The purpose is not to erase diversity or deny history, quite the opposite, in fact, but rather to help Rwandans to see themselves and each other and foremost as a compatriot. Dr. Gregory Stanton, that uh, Professor Gatsinzi has named, a former official with the State Department, has identified eight stages of genocide that start with the classification of the victim group and end with the genocide denial where perpetrators deny that they committed any crimes and uh, often blame what happened on the victim. In the Rwanda case, it's no exaggeration to say that the seeds of denial were planted from the very moment the case started. Last month, ladies and gentlemen, a fact surprised French historians issued a 1,200-page report to President Macron on France's role with respect to the genocide. So the Clerk report, as it's known, ascribes overwhelming responsibilities to Paris for its action leading up to and during and after genocide, concluding in blunt terms that it was responsible for, and I quote, a political, institutional, intellectual, moral, and cognitive failure. 
What the report also touches on are efforts from the outset to confound the historical record by the active dissemination of politically motivated lies at the highest levels of the French government. These pernicious lies attempt to attribute the events of 1994 to chaotic African barbarism, blaming all sides equally and raising from the record the extent to which the genocide was, in fact, carefully planned and brutally executed by the government and the military at the highest level. Sadly, I have to say also that a handful of academics and journalists in the West, including here in the United States, have proven susceptible to revisionist narrative. Not coincidentally, these theories are relentlessly promoted by a network of well-connected Rwandans in exile who are desperate to conceal their own complicity and who harbor ambitions of returning Rwanda to the mire of pre-19 ethnic politics. Ladies and gentlemen, let me make this clear. Make no mistake. Rwandans in 2021 have no desire to turn, to turn back the clock and will fight the denial and revisionism at every turn. The stakes are too high not to. We reject the world the politics of ethnic division and hatred. Today, we embrace our shared national identity as Rwandans. It's working. Reconciliation is always a work in progress, and it's undeniably difficult. Imagine how tough it has been on survivors who are often asked to live side by side with people who might have perpetrated the crimes against them or their families during the genocide. But without reconciliation, there is no peace, there is no security. Without reconciliation, there is no economic development. Without reconciliation, there is no improvement in the health status or quality of life that Dr. Margie and Sain has uh, uh, charted, has uh, uh, discussed with us. In his remarks during the commemoration of the genocide against the Tutsi, President Kagame underlined the dynamic between the past and the future. We cannot turn the clock back, nor can we uh, undo the harm caused, but we have the power to determine the future to ensure that what happened never happens again. And his message has strongly resonated and still guides us in our aspiration to renew ourselves in a united nation. Reconciliation was not imposed from the top down as a matter of public policy, but was achieved through active and willing participation by citizens from all walks of life, including survivors, perpetrators, and returning refugees. Together we renew, we renew, we choose a collective future through the construction of another better and possible history. As the theme indicates, remember, unite and renew, define the Rwanda of today, a country of hope. Rwanda is a country uh, and deniably shaped by unspeakable tra uh, tragedy, but not beholden to it. The ethos of never again permeates society at every level as it must. But for never again to become a reality, we must, all of us here, all of us in the world first commit to never forget. I thank you again for your solidarity and care as we commemorate for the 27th time the genocide against the Tutsi. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. And I take this moment to thank the distinguished guests and panelists that came and shared with us today. Dr. Ensign, Dr. Linda, Dr. Gatsinzi, Mr. Chusa, Ms. Horan Bond, Aline, and Ayana. And Madam Ambassador, thank you again for hosting this event. This is the beginning of the season, a solemn season that we observe and commemorate the events of 1994. And if you need to get more information, you can contact the Embassy of Rwanda. They will have the schedules anytime from now on through the end of the season. Today you have heard and you have had an opportunity to learn a little bit about our history, but most importantly, about the deliberate intent of some players who would like to have us forget the atrocities in Rwanda. 
those atrocities took almost a million, if not more lives in a simple 100 days because the killers could do it with impunity. As you heard from Aline, it was horrible. You have heard how well the country is doing and you have heard the resilience and this speaks to resilience of Rwanda, the people of Rwanda. And we invite you, if you have never had a chance to visit Rwanda, so you can come and see and hear for yourself so that you also can share your own story, your own version of what Rwanda is today. So those voices that want us to be quiet, the denialists, can hear it from you as well. Never again, never again. And we hope to see you again, this place, same time next year. God bless you and go in peace. Thank you again for being here today.